This is Star Talk. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. I serve as the director of New York City's Hayden Planetarium, part of the American Museum of Natural History, right here in Manhattan. This, as Cosmic Queries, you know who my co-host is, Chuck. What's up, Neil? Oh, thanks for being there in arm's reach. In of digital arm's reach. Digital arm's reach, yes. exactly. I feel your zeros and ones kind of <laughs> touching my face right now. <laughs> There you go. Uh, base two, zeros, and ones. That's right. You know what the topic is today? Interspecies communication. Ah, yes. Ooh, that's yes. just well, creepy. Well, it's... I mean, it's beautiful, but creepy. It's gorgeous. Not, not as gorgeous as interspecies dating, but hey, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? <laughs> I don't know what that means. Hey, T. Uh, hey. What we have is one of the world's experts on this, who is a professor of psychology at Hunter College, and is in the Animal Behavior and Comparative Psychology doctoral program at the Graduate Center of CUNY, the City University of New York, the one and the only, Professor Diana Reese. Diana, welcome to Star Talk. Well, hi, thanks for having me today. And you've been in our backyard the whole time we've been having Star Talk, and where you been? I'm here in New York. (laughs) You're just right there. You've been talking to other animals, I think. That's it, yes. Instead of your own damn species, all right? I've been been hanging out with dolphins. (laughs) So let me just get the audience to know you a little better. Uh, You have a, 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 a TED Talk where you share the platform with others who were trying to create something big. And what was that? Yeah, back in uh, 2013, my three colleagues, we say my partners on this, um, were Peter Gabriel, the musician and visionary, uh, uh, Vint Cerf, who was the co-founder or the co-father of the internet, that's right, the co-founder of the internet, and um, Neil Gershenfeld, who's the director of the MIT Center for Bits and Atoms. Okay, think, so no matter what, what you guys talked about in that TED video, it seems to me you have the power, knowledge, and wisdom to make it happen. Yeah, <laughs> given, exactly. Yeah. Given that list. <laughs> it's, it's, they're, they're a great group of people to work with, and we've been uh-huh. working together uh, with, with where we have this idea. It was actually Peter Gabriel who started this idea and then approached the three of us. Um, and the idea is that how, is how can we use technology um, and our, our new technologies along with ideas that we have to bridge the gap in terms of communication with other animals. We share this planet with lots of other species, obviously. They have brains. They're all communicating. We just can't crack their codes. So one of the ideas behind the interspecies internet is coming up with new interfaces so that we can communicate with these other species, creating artificial codes or devices that allow them a voice is the, is the simplest way of saying it. And then we can use these shared codes to communicate. The other aspect of it is, is finding new ways to decode or to, to, to decipher the signals that they're all using amongst themselves. So that's the basic idea. So, so you what, what do you have to define communication first? Because, I mean, when you talk about all these different species, let's just take, for instance, some insects. Their language is chemical. So, you know, what, what is language? What is communication? Chuck, you just nailed the big question, the big question and the, the thing that's so under such debate. So the question is, first of all, are we the only species that use a kind of communication that we say is language, where we use signals that are meaningful and that refer to things in the environment? We call those referential signals. So when I point to an apple, I'm using a symbol, I'm using a word that doesn't look anything like an apple, but it refers to that, and we can use that in a shared way to communicate. Now, bees, the little bees, were actually the first species in which that someone actually decoded some of their communication and got a Nobel Prize for it. This was a yeah. long time ago. This because they person. twerk. That's how. That's how they talk to each other. <laughs> they they, they twerk. They're like, yo, I check, check it I out. That. Yeah. Look, yeah, thanks for letting me know the bees twerk. Okay? This is, uh, that's a new way of saying it, Chuck, but it's true. They move their wiggle, they shake their bodies, they do this waggle dance. Or they shake their booty. Dance, right? And they communicate not only where food is outside their hive, but the distance from the hive. And they, believe it or not, they, these little bees with just, you know, with a little brain are communicating changes in the location of the food base and they have to track the distance of the food from the sun. But guess what? As you know, what's happening with the, the sun earth? moves. 
well, Earth rotates. Earth yeah. is rotating, so the disk, the sun is moving to them, and uh, they have to track that, and they they keep that in they keep that in their communication. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. These little bees do that. That's so why they're always following Cardi B. <laughs> <laughs> so Diana, you literally yeah. wrote the book on on some of this. You uh, back uh, ten, about ten years ago. I have the title: "The Dolphin in the Mirror: Exploring Dolphin Minds and Saving Dolphin Lives." So you you've you've been your professional career is invested in trying now now dolphins have way bigger brains than do bees. So presumably you chose them because of whatever similarities you can. Uh, aligned with humans, is that right? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. My background, believe it or not, was in theater. I was actually a set designer for many theater. years. Theater. Theater. Yes. A theater. I worked in the <laughs> uh, but I but Thank you. <laughs> we won't. We won't go there in too much detail. But um, I, I was always really fascinated by animals, and I had an academic background. I wound up taking extra courses, going back for my PhD, and I was reading about um, whales getting slaughtered about these, you know, the whaling in general. And I, I already knew I wanted to study animal behavior. And I started looking up what we knew about whales and dolphins. And at the time, it wasn't, there wasn't that much known. It was in the late 70s. And I, I never watched Flipper. I wasn't a Flipper fan. I used to watch Lassie. And, um, but the more I learned about dolphins, I thought, wow, these are really big brained, complex animals. And we don't know very much about them. They seem to be complex in terms of these societies in the seas. Um, we didn't know much about their communication systems. But again, they have these big, magnificent brains. What are they doing with And it's bigger brains? than our brain, right? They are bigger than our brains, but their mm -hmm. bodies are bigger than our bodies. So when we think about brain size, and think about it relative to body size. It's called the, get ready for this one, the encephalization quotient or EQ. It's brain size relative to body size. So Dana, where are humans on this encephalization quotient? Yeah, so our brains are seven times the size they would need to be to run a body of our size. Okay, because we're, gotcha. we're talking about body, body weight, body, the body weight, and the brain weight, okay, the brain size that way. So our brain is seven times, think about it as our brain being seven times the size it needs to run a body of our size. Mm -hmm. For dolphins, they have a brain that's about four and a half, uh, 4.2 or 4.3, if you wanna get really specific, times the size it needs to be to run a body of that size. Most animals are, have the value of one. It, their brain is just the right size to run a body of that size, okay, in terms of map metabolism and everything else. So, so those butt heads on Star Trek, the guys with the big giant butt heads, they're- Really smart, right? They're super, I mean, they're like the <laughs> right. smartest people in the universe. <laughs> really big brains, okay? So, yeah, so it gives us a sense. Now, if we look at, you know, abs if we look, think about brains though, it, it's still a huge mystery in terms of what, this, what the recipe is for being more intelligent you know, more to have more intelligence. Is it the number of neurons? Is it the organization of a brain? Is it, you know, how the, how it's all connected? So that's still a mystery. It just turns out that if we look at animals that show uh, complex social interactions and uh, have a lot of complexity in their behavior, they tend to be these animals that have these uh, really high values in EQ. So those animals are animals like uh, cetaceans, which are whales and dolphins, the great apes, elephants, along with us humans. And then, it, you know, it varies when you look at that sort of full scale. I, I always thought apes were great. I, I always thought so. <laughs> apes are really yeah. smart. Yeah. You know. <laughs> So you know, do, do they I knew have... a great ape once. He was great. He was great. <laughs> but did you get started in this at, right around the time when dolphins were getting trapped in tuna nets? And this was, oh. there's a whole huge outcry for in the fishing industry about this? I, I, I started a little bit before that. I, I started about, uh, I started studying dolphins in the early 80s, late, actually even the late 70s. But I actually worked on that project to try to stop dolphins from getting caught in the tuna nets. That was a big issue. As a scientist, I do science for learning, you know, the basic, basic science. But then I think it's really important to apply that, to do what we call translational science and apply it to really help protect those animals in conservation and welfare and stop these horrible situations. All right, why didn't anyone try to protect the tuna? 
<laughs> Somehow that, it was okay because, to trap a, a net full of tuna. Dolphins are not delicious. <laughs> Well, no, no, I'm very serious, Diana. Yeah, is it, aren't you being speciesist here? You're saying, "Oh, protect the dolphin, eat the tuna." They're both big fish in the ocean, and well, you're and you're dividing it up, and you're showing preferences. What's going on here? You're making really good points, Neil. So, first of all, dolphins are mammals. We know that, and fish, and there's, and what we know about dolphins right now, and I'm not going to say we shouldn't be protecting fish species because it's really important to protect all species on the planet so they can continue to survive. I want to say that right up. But with dolphins, these are large-brained, highly social, self-aware, meaning self-aware and socially aware animals that feel pain and they can suffer. And they were treated in this way in the tuna nets where they'd get suff they would be suffocated they would drown. or trapped, drowned. They, they would, would drown. be hoisted oh, right, up. Because they have to come up for air, they unlike actually, like, the tuna. Like us. And uh, again, it was it was just a horrendous situation. And okay, we, so you're but you're admitting that you're you 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 more highly value mammals than non mammal vertebrates. No, I, it's I, just that canned dolphin does not <laughs> sound or taste good. No, oh. we're we're not going there. Canned can dolphin flipper. is not a thing, and it shouldn't be a thing. Okay. <laughs> although having some of this flipper salad, right? <laughs> exactly. Although, Mayo. You know, People in certain countries are still eating dolphin. Oh no! Or, and eating whale, even though no. this, yeah, absolutely. So in Japan, I don't know if you saw the film The Cove. It won. Oh, an I, it's Oscar. on my list. It's on my list. Okay. Very important. Didn't that win an Academy Award for documentary? It, it did. Or was it, it was in the running if it didn't win? No, it, no, yeah. it won the Academy Award for the best documentary. I worked on that film. I was a science advisor, and I was actually the person that told the director about the situation because many of my colleagues and I have been trying to stop these horrible drive hunts in Japan, where dolphins are herded, H-E-R-D-E-D, -E -E yeah. herd, herded, um, using a method where they create an acoustic, uh, an acoustic barrier, it's called oikomi, and they bang on pipes and they scare the dolphins into this cove when they're the, and afterwards they're slaughtered. Some of the dolphins are still taken to um, specific aquariums. Most aquariums in the world absolutely oppose this and have been working to stop it. But some aquariums in Japan, China, and a few other countries procure their dolphins from these drive hunts. And these animals are, 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 are then taken and the rest of the group is killed. And they're killed absolutely in the most inhumane manner you can imagine. They shouldn't be killed at all. But when you see how they're killed, Everybody who would see this would want to stop it, and it needs. Okay, to but stop. let's say they found a humane way to kill them. You're still preferring to protect the life of fellow mammals than fellow non-mammal vertebrates. As a, right? as a marine, let me say it this way: as a marine mammal scientist, I feel like it, I need to have a voice in this political arena. And yes, I think that for dolphins, they shouldn't. I can say clearly: these animals need protection; they shouldn't be killed. Period. Okay, but if, I, if I'm I a marine we, tuna scientist. Then we duke it out at the at the science conference because I want to protect my tuna. Right, and, and I want to protect and, and the tuna, tuna scientist well. loses every time because <laughs> tuna is tasty. are <laughs> stupid and delicious. <laughs> well, let's let, let's try this one. What if we could pr make sure that the population the, we're, that we're conserving tuna populations, and when they are captured, it's done in the most humane way possible. That's the win-win. So why yeah, don't we love try it. for that? Yeah. There you I go. love it. Yeah, that's, it's that's tough. the way to do it. Yeah, it's a yeah. tough. So I think we have to be humane if we're still eating animals, and I think that's really critical. So that's, now, that's true uh, across the spectrum of animals. Across the sure. spectrum, yes, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. As a marine mammal scientist, I speak out about the dolphins because that's where my area of expertise is. But I really vote for all animals. I would rather that nobody's eating any animals. To tell you the truth, I, that's what my big push is. But you know, people then you have to deal with the people who want to protect plants. Yes, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> I, many years ago, I worked at the Wildlife Conservation Society, you know, we're uh -huh. our five zoos, and I ran the animal enrichment program, and I was running a dolphin research lab there. And my husband used to joke, he said, you can't have anybody she works with over for dinner, because you can't eat anything. Either they work with that animal, or it's a plant that they're cultivating. So there's nothing going on. You just have to live off the air. Right. And then that's, that's the best, that's the best you can do. Right. Right.
Well, well, Chuck, I think we don't have time in this segment for Q and A. We'll, we'll we'll start right up in segment two. Okay. Uh, you got your questions lined up, solicited got them from right the internet. Here. Got them you got, right here. You got them all there. Okay. So when we come back, more with uh, behavioral animal psychologist Diana Reese and Chuck Nice bringing the questions. We'll be right back. We're back. Star Talk, Cosmic Queries. Co host Chuck Nice. Hey, hey. Tweeting as Chuck Nice Comic still? Thank you, sir. Okay. Chuck Nice Comic, yes. Uh, and our, our expert today on interspecies communication, Diana Reese. Diana, welcome back to Star Talk. Thanks. And we've got questions for you solicited from our fan base all across okay. the social media uh, platforms. So, Chuck, what do you have? Okay. Well, of course, you know, we always start with a Patreon patron because. Mm -hmm. They support us financially, and quite you frankly, mean they pay us. Yes, okay. Yes, there's no better support. Okay, <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. no better support. There's no better nation than a donation. Anyway, uh, <laughs> this is Kyle Marston from Patreon. Um, hey, thanks for the kind of weird hashtag CQ Interspecies, and how could we use the periodic table of elements and chemistry to communicate with life that demonstrates the capacity for the classification of potentially intelligent as an alphabet person, man, woman, camera, TV might be considered. Um, not sure that well, reference. Yeah. So, so let me let me see if I can reword that question. All right. Okay. So we have the periodic table of elements, highly organized achievement of our understanding of the nature of matter and materials in the world. Mm -hmm. If we have an alien and we want to communicate with them, do you see value in organizing information in this similar way, inf information that we overlap with them? so that we can possibly come to a common vocabulary. Is it that, I think that's what they're asking there, Chuck, is it? I, yeah, I mean, it's... Yeah, you know, if we use the periodic table of yeah. elements as our own sort of reference like that's, frame That's our this. preference, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Right. So that, with that, that, I mean, that, that's, I don't know, I'm gonna follow up with a question, but that, I guess this is more for Neil, like, would that be the same everywhere? I mean, the stuff would be the same. Yeah, everything we understand about chemistry tells us right. that if they were far enough along, they would have the, the periodic table of elements or have something more advanced that we haven't come to yet. Okay. But that right. they would certainly have that organization. Yes. Okay. So Diana, what, what can you tell us yeah. about organizing information and use that as a foundation to communicate? Right. So first of all, Carl, I want to thank Carl for that question because it's a really cool question. So if you're face to face, let's say we're coming face to face or face to tentacle, with an alien, because we don't know, right? No, yeah, well, aliens have tentacles, of course, and antenna, they, of course they do. Well, they as, as we've seen recently in some in some films, um, you know, one of the beginning things is we have to figure out what their sensory systems are, okay, if we're face-to-face. -face. There's, and, and what kinds of signals may be perceived by each of us. So there's a lot, there's a lot of, um, first steps that we have to take. Now, if in communication, and we can come back to that in a minute, I'm assuming now that we're talking about that we've received some kind of signal and we're not face to face from what from Carl's question and that they've sent us something that we have deciphered as the periodic table or an equivalent of the periodic table. Is that, am I on or, the right track here? Or is, is the organization of the periodic table useful to bring other kinds of communication to bear on, on that encounter? Yeah. So, I mean, if we know that we have some shared point of reference, that the universe is organized in this particular way, then we have to find a way of letting them know we're perceiving their signal. It's meaningful to us in that way and giving them a signal back to say, yes, this has been received. Here is the equivalent for us. And now you're trying to align your knowledge bases. Okay. Because what, what, the, the question I keep on I think I, I keep on having about this is what is it in their signal that we've gotten that that lets us know that they have this organization now the other aspect of it is the question is we can say we are going to make the assumption and I think this is what you're saying Neil that we have a common knowledge base of the universe if we're both intelligent species. Then we can encode something in a way, or we have to try to encode something in a way that would be perceivable to another. We'd have to either find, um, use math and assume they know our math or know our chemistry 
and try to set up that communication where we're showing equivalence as, and use that as a bridge. It gets into a common knowledge or something that's shared mm -hmm. and finding the right way to share it. And that's not trivial. Well, it's not, but I love the fact that, you know, as you guys are talking, so I'm seeing atoms and molecules as like a base. And so I'm asking this, would atoms and molecules look the same to everyone in the universe as they do to us? Chuck, you just said one of the biggest questions for me is, look, what if other, this other intelligence doesn't see, doesn't even see? I mean, we're making the assumption that sight, that vision is going to be one of the main w ways this creature would sense the world. I mean, it just seems it's we're such visual creatures. What if they're not using sight as their main sense, or it's not the same kind of sight? They have different receptors. And we're very physiologically biased, is what you're saying. Absolutely. For, for our own senses, sensory. So how would you connect that to... Uh, Chuck, you probably have another question related to this, but when you try to talk to dolphins, um, we can't compare periodic tables of elements. No. We can't say, this is an apple, what is your, what's your word for apple? We can't do that. So what is what overlaps that even empowers you to even ask the audacious question, let's start uh, with yeah. something that we have in common and what would you... Yeah. Where would you go from there? Uh, let me jump to the film Arrival for a minute, because I think that could illustrate the point. I don't know if they... Okay, the, few, the couple of films named Arrival, you mean the one where the alien visited? The but, alien? I think they both were, but the one with the, the septipod. The heptapods, yeah. The, the heptapods, heptapods yes, come heptapod. down, mm -hmm. and um, the, the scientists, the linguists... Thank you, Chuck, for that <laughs> visual. Did you like that? That was my, that was my heptapod... Uh, there uh, check, you go. Put up his fingers up into the camera, right. and right. he's okay. pretending like... You're not <laughs> squirting ink, though. You have to squirt ink. <laughs> <laughs> The, um, um, this linguist is, is approached by the government and they say, hey, decode these aliens, start communicating with them, find out what they want here, you know, because they're, they're, they're trying, they're scared. This is an alien that's, that's landed. A bunch of aliens have landed. And she says, wait, wait, wait a minute. We've got to back up. It's not that fast. And, and she's completely right. If you're trying to communicate, first of all, you have to have some sense of who they are, what their sensory systems are like. So she spent weeks just watching them, trying to interact with them, creating something in common so they could start sharing. And that was critical. It was very, very important and insightful by the writers, the writer of the original story, that it's not just, oh, you start communicating. It doesn't happen that way. It doesn't happen that way with dolphins. Sometimes you'll have a breakthrough with the dolphin rather quickly. And I'm gonna tell you a story about one of those breakthroughs that happened really quickly. Okay, in a few minutes. But, you know, she had she watched them and she started also imitating what they were doing. Imitation is a wonderful way to start communicating. So it, it's if we go to another film like Close Encounters of the Third Kind, that's what happened when they were started when they started communicating with the aliens. Remember the sounds that the alien ship was producing? Bum, bum, what bum, it, bum, bum. Yeah. <laughs> what did we do? The people who were on Earth started imitating that, that kind of musical note, uh, that musical com composition, and they were suddenly in sync. They were communicating. I recognize you. I'm repeating back what you do. That's the beginning of communication. I'm imitating you and repeating it back. Now, I want to jump to a dolphin situation. Wait, before you, before you give your dolphin example, just back to the Arrival movie for a second. Am I so wrong to think that I would not have sent a linguist and a physicist, I would have sent an astrobiologist and a cryptographer. Could you tell me what a linguist has over a cryptographer in that situation? Hmm. That yeah, I, you, because I, clearly they thought about that, as you say. Right. They, 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 knew, they, they knew what they were doing for their storyline. It just would not have been my first thought. Yeah, it wouldn't have been my first thought either. And I think personally, I would have sent a cryptologist and someone who studies communication in other animals, and oh. an astrophysicist. I mean, like you. I would have had. A, yeah, I would have. <laughs> asked, uh, how how very Dick Cheney of you! Sorry, I'm looking. Right. I'm looking for a vice president. I have found your vice president, <laughs> and it's me. 
It could, didn't have to be me, but it should be somebody who has some experience with just other like you. Guys. Yes. But somebody, yeah, in that realm. I've actually, okay. yeah, I actually, I actually did some work with with a SETI project many years ago, talking about that this is a great training ground uh, when we study species, other species, and try. Don't to worry, Diana. We would have sent you too, so don't Which worry about it. Yeah, we got we, we we got your back on this. Thing. Okay, yes. thanks, guys. Thanks. So, what's your what's your it. dolphin story? Yeah. So we're talking about imitation. And when I, I had what I call my first encounter with a dolphin mind. OK. And I was a graduate student at the time and I was just starting my research and I was working with this young dolphin named Circe. And I was asked to teach her uh, to just stay with me in front of me and eat fish that had been that were three times the size of her head. And uh, they were frozen dead fish that were now defrosted so she could eat them. And I thought, well, this is too big to give this dolphin. So I cut them into heads, middles, and tail sections. Uh, little Circe readily ate the heads. She ate the middles. She spit out every tail. And I looked at them, and they had fins, spiny fins. So I cut off the fins thinking maybe they would be more palatable. And then she ate everything. Now, in the course of training her to stay with me while I was feeding her, um, if she broke station, that's this term we use that means they leave before you want them to, I would give her a timeout, which meant I would back away about 15, 10 to 15 feet from the pool. And, and it broke the, her ability to interact or get fish. And then I just stand there and look at her. And then I would come back. So and punished I punished her. That's a punishment. Well, it's a kind of a, it's a way to say you've done the wrong thing. Okay, you can think about it as a punishment, but it wasn't, I didn't think about it that strongly. I had to say, because I didn't have a shared code, you've done something wrong. And this was a technique that many people used with animals at the time. We don't use it so much anymore. You sort of say, you just back away. Negative and, reinforcement. Yeah, it's yeah, negative yeah, yeah. reinforcement. Yeah, it's, not, it's not that you're inflicting harm on right. her wrongdoing. You're just removing something that she was enjoying. Right. Exactly. In that moment, okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I would back away. And it could, again, it could be for several seconds or you know, 10 to 15 seconds, you know, five seconds. I varied it. And then I would come back and she learned, hey, something's wrong. You know, and it would get corrected. And she was a really smart dolphin. And she learned very quickly, don't leave until I go like this at the end. And it means every, and I'd show her an empty bucket and everything's done. Um, again, she was young and I had to teach her this for, not for me, but for the people who, where I was working. So everything's going fine. Cersei's eating all the fish. She's basically trained me to cut her fish just the right way. I used to joke about that. And um, now one day by accident, I happened to give her an uncut tail. And Cersei looked up at me, her eyes got really big. She spit it out and she bolted across the pool and took a vertical position and just stayed there across oh, the pool and snap. stared at me. Oh yeah. Oh. So and she, I, gave, she gave you a timeout. Wait, wait, so that's where you need that music. Yeah. <laughs> and at, at the time, the Mexican, I mean, the, the Western standoff. Yeah. <laughs> so what's going on here? I mean, is she, she's is she really doing this? It's an anecdote. It's a one observation. But as a scientist, I thought, wow, if she's really imitating and using this to communicate to me that I'm doing something wrong, like I commuted communicated to something you know something to her that's really pretty amazing so but i couldn't do anything with one an n of one so what i did was i set up an experiment where i was very careful to feed her properly and give her all perfectly cut fish over the next couple of sessions she never did it and then on purpose three on three different occasions i gave her an uncut tail and each time she went across the pool and did this to me that's the beginning of communication that's how it starts and again it's based on this idea i talked to you about she's observing me she's really smart and she's using something i do back and there have been cases like so this. she she called the time out on you is what yeah, happened did. I, I think she did and 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 i actually wrote this you know up better than to cut my fish like that <laughs> That's right. I, I how trained many times you I'm gonna to teach serve you? me. How many times I'm going to teach you how to cut It's so hard fish. to get good help these days. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Stupid humans. They don't even know how to cut a fish tail. <laughs> what can I tell you? So I learned my lesson from that. But I also wrote a chapter on this in my doctoral dissertation. It was probably the best chapter in the whole thing. I think that was the best one. And it, it was because I partnered with her. She gave me this idea. And it's really fascinating because I think these are really smart, smart creative animals who are watching us, they're communicating back. And often it's a problem that we just ha don't have the means or the system that we can look at it 
where we can show people scientifically they understand these sounds, these symbols, and they can use them. And that's I, a lot I saw, of I saw a comic once. It might have been a, in The New Yorker uh, where these two dolphins are swimming. And one <laughs> says to the other, speaking of humans, one says to the other, you know, they face each other and make noises, but it's not clear they're ever actually communicating with each yeah, other. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> The dolphin analysis of humans. Yes, and that's very much what we do with most other animals, to tell you. <laughs> we got to take yeah. another break. I, we only got to one question in that segment. Yeah. Chuck. Who cares? It's such a great conversation. Chuck, all right. When we what? come back, we'll see if we can bang out more than one question in the segment <laughs> yeah. on interspecies communication with Professor Diana Reese when we return. Cosmic Queries. Star Talk. Interspecies communication. Diana Reese. So, Diana, if someone wants to see more beyond this episode, how do they get uh, get connected? Okay, they can go to... Whether or not they're human, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I welcome all. <laughs> um, uh, so, so where's the best place for them to land? For the, uh, they can look at interspecies.io. That's uh, a website. For my, yes, and mm -hmm. for my research with my colleague, Marcelo Magnasco, who's a professor at Rockefeller University, they can put in Reese M two C two, and it will get them there. Reese R I E S S at R E R E I S S E I S S M two yeah R E I S S M two C two, and it will get them to the website, our website. Excellent, excellent. Well, Chuck, this is a cosmic queries, and you've only delivered me one and a half questions so far. Well, so, and they were go. they were so good. You got to up your game here, okay? <laughs> All right, let's go. Give All it right, to let's me. get to this. Torin let's, try, babe, let's call the whole segment a lightning round, okay? All right. All right let's do it. <clears throat> so, Dan, you have from... to answer as though this is the evening news, and you have to give me a sound bite. Super short. Okay. <clears throat> okay, go. Torin Wallengren from Patreon says, what kind of nonverbal communication is already common between humans and other species? Is it more common than we think? I know my cat wants to go outside when he starts scratching the door. Mm. Better that than him scratching your face. So. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so we might split between domestic animals and the rest of the animal kingdom. So what do you say there, Diana? Yeah. So animals are communicating with us all the time and we're communicating back. These are not part of science studies, it's basic communication. They watch us, we watch them, and we get, the more familiar we are, the more we learn to interpret that. So your cat or your dog is watching you, it's reading your behavior, you're doing the same. That's communication. The and how about, when they, have, how about they want, when they wanna be subterfugal and they wanna deceive you? That's a whole other situation. Okay. Deception, <laughs> deception is not, it's not well studied in the non-human animal world yet, but it's a really interesting topic. The reason why I but ask is, is um, you know, I, I was visiting someone's home and they have a sign there because th they have a lot of dogs and the dogs always sit and beg while you're eating dinner. The sign says, the dog has been fed. Don't believe is bullshit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the dog will look my... at you like it's never been fed in its whole life. Oh. I think our, our pets do this a lot. My cat goes to my husband and looks like I haven't been fed in five days. You know, I just fed the cat. He just but they know not it. to go to you but, because you, you don't put up with that. Now, my cat also does it to me later. If, if my, cat does it, my cat does it when my husband has just fed them okay. as well. <laughs> See, so, that, that's, uh, that's, that's the diabolical it, thinking. It, yeah. It's not right. just animals. I have three children and they all do the same <laughs> thing. Okay, so. All right, this is uh, no, Colton keep going, Judd. Judd. <laughs> This is Colton Judd. Colton says, uh, my question is on FRBs. Since we've detected them, we've gotten quite a few over the years. How confident are you that any of these could be communication from an advanced alien civilization in a different galaxy or solar system? Is that possible? I am also a huge fan of the show. I think it's awesome and you guys are doing great work. Okay. Excellent. So, so, that, so Diana, that turns out to be a question for me. These are, uh, FRBs are short for fast radio bursts and so there are two things we have to consider here. Either it's a new phenomenon in the universe that we don't have prior data to inform us on, and so we should study it, or it's intelligent aliens trying to send us a signal, okay? And every time we have a new telescope that has new capabilities and, and new powers, we discover stuff that we'd never seen before. That's very natural. So if I'm a betting person, I would say it's probably some new phenomenon that we have yet to classify and understand. And that'll be, I'll think that it's that before I will think that it's intelligent aliens beaming signals at us. 
And that's that just what why, ha- And that's why we can't answer them. Because Neil is like, this is not the communication. And they're like, why won't you answer us? Because Neil will not let us answer you. Oh, it's all my fault. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure you have to check with everybody you know, too, on the planet who's listening. And make sure it's not coming from a source that we know. No, yeah. What will happen is they'll, they'll check, they'll come visit, visit uh, Earth and say, Where's that guy, Neil Tyson? We gotta have a word with him. (laughs) Dude, how come you're calling? Yo, I was texting you, man. How come you keep ignoring my text? (laughs) All right, all right. Let's move on. Uh, Let's keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. Um, Oh, wow, this is a great one. Douglas Stern says, do we have any idea how swarms of fish communicate? Like when they form a tight-knit ball to avoid predators. Well, at least the ones on the inside avoid the predators. <laughs> ah, cause, cause, let me tell you, the ones on the outside of that ball aren't having such a good go of it. Um, how do they know to stay in such perfect formation and dance and weave in unison? Hopefully humans wouldn't need uh, to mimic this behavior when the aliens come. <laughs> <laughs> so, Diana, do we really know everything we should know about how even species communicate with themselves? Enough to give me confidence that you are making progress in interspecies communication? Because if we, if we don't know why birds flock and other kind of emergent phenomena, but you're trying to find out how we can communicate with another species, is, is that putting the cart in front of the horse? Yeah, it's a good question, Neil. So I think what it, they kind of go hand in hand with each other, looking, trying to decode communi- the communication, what we call interest, species communication between the species, the two, between, right, between their yeah. own right, themselves. When I, when I see a termite species. colony, there's, yeah. a, there's a million termites and they all seem to know what they're doing because at the end of the day, yeah. there's they a, love an 11 gossip. foot mound. They yeah. love gossip, that's how they do it. <laughs> is that what that is? Termites. That's what's oh, really you, happening. You cannot shut those termites <laughs> up. They. Uh... That's what's really happening. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, they, a, there are a lot of there are a lot of studies right now that have been that are going on now and that have gone on to try to decode the species' own signals, and we do that too with dolphins. We try to understand how they're using their own signals, and then when we make those steps into interspecies communication between us and dolphins, we try to incorporate signals that they, they may find meaningful or useful. Again, we'll develop a relationship with them. And then we, we're not using human words. We don't want, I don't wanna use words with them. They can't produce words. We've created, for example, we've created an underwater keyboard and now a touch screen that gives them visual forms that we know they can see. And then we, if they touch those forms on a touch screen, they hear a whistle or that they can hear, they can imitate, and they get specific things. So we meet them halfway using Very more cool. their code. So, so, uh, so you have a giant iPad for dolphins. <laughs> I, 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 you know what? You know that's going to lead to dolphin Tinder. You know that. <laughs> Swipe. You know there's the going to be dolphins swiping right now. <laughs> Actually, we've watched them do that movement, the swiping. But we, when we first gave them the keyboard, the touchscreen, um, it's a four by eight foot touchscreen. It's actually an optical touchscreen. If they touch it, it, their touch is actually seen by cameras. So it's optically sensed. But oh, I they, got you. Okay. First day they saw this, we did, a, we did what we called whack-a-fish, not whack-a-mole, to see if it would work. And we had fish going across the screen. They, one of the young dolphins who had never seen anything technical like this just immediately started touching all the fish he looked like a teenager going for the fish he was wow. great yeah. <laughs> so amazing. just to be clear when in the technology their nose touching the screen is not what you're sensing you have cameras that are triangulating on where the nose touch and that gives it a coordinate and that, but yeah. correct and right, okay. just just to be it's not their nose their nose is actually their blowhole that's right, at the back right. of their head it's the beak or the rostrum that touches got on right yeah. on just um to- so wait, so, wait, wait, so that's not their nose in the front? No, no. Nope. That's their they rostrum? Re- that's their rostrum or beak. That's their I, mouth and the Okay, it, yeah. Diana, I'm never going to call it their rostrum, okay? I, I would How about defy. Beak? <laughs> beak, How about okay. beak? <laughs> and you know okay. what? Here's why, no, here's why nobody will call it that, because <laughs> you got, well, not you, Diana, biologists named one of the dolphins a bottle-nosed dolphin. Thank right. you. There What's it is. The so, <laughs> oh, what's well, so you? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, how about what we? Why don't we agree to call it its snoot? How about that? 
It's yeah. snout. If they could call oh, it a snout. snout. Snout, yeah. snout. I'll give you that. Yeah. Yep. We're, we're we'll on the same that. page. Okay, we'll so we're now, we're now communicating, Neil. Yes, we, we, <laughs> we have some intra-species communication. There's hope for us here. Okay. Right. Uh, that's is great. Right, Chuck, give me okay, some let's go to Tim Wirt. He's a Patreon patron who says this. What tools or techniques are used to discover communication in the animal world? Especially, I wonder how we really know what we understand an animal is trying to tell us. Ah. So... so yeah, like it's pretty easy to know that an animal understands us. It's hard for us to know if we understand them, you know. Um, so w what are the tools that yeah. say this is how we know? Yeah, well, it's not easy. And we use cameras. We use video cameras. We use recording to other kinds of recording devices to record their sound, to record uh, movement. And then we try to see how they use their how they use sound and movement and perhaps smell the different senses in their social interactions. So that's one way, but it's laborious. I mean, people, it takes years to try to understand what signals, uh, what signals go with what behaviors. And again, but these, this is what we use. We have to use our powers of observation. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just our eyes and our ears and watching, that's a good way to start. But then we use other recording devices and then we use computers and we use big data analysis now, hopefully will help us, you know, coupled with us to have breakthroughs in learning about the patterns that these animals use. And and Janet, every time I see a nature documentary and the animals doing some weird behavior, they always say, oh, it's a it's a mating ritual. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe they're just trying to order pizza, you know? Yeah, right. right. <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah. You're right. I, it, it is always it's a, a mating ritual. Every single yeah. time. Yeah. We well, see here the mating dance. <laughs> <laughs> of the whatever. right, and then it, uh, then uh, insert species here. Right. They just trying to order pizza. That's really all. Right, 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 right. That's, that's it. But you know, so animals communicate about mating. They communicate about fi finding food. But they always they also are doing a whole lot more than we ever expected. And the more studies that we we read about, we realize, wow, we never thought that animals have alarm calls and that other animals will listen to. Like who's in the environment, which predators in the environment, and then it helps them know what escape route to go to, or you know. They're saying each other, "Freddy's back." You know, Freddy so the bully funny. is back. You know. Yeah. Well, there you go, right? <laughs> but you know, just yet, if, if I can share an observation with you, yeah. I, I grew up in the city in New York City, and so the sounds of the city are actually mm -hmm. rather soothing to me. And it's the traffic and alarm horns and sirens and people and the, the bar spills out into the street. This, this is the sounds of my own species. And I'm actually quite comforted when I hear it. I go into the wilderness in the woods and I hear people say, oh, it's so peaceful. I say, no, it's not. There's like crickets and cicadas and there's all this noise. Every animal is talking to every other animal and you find that soothing, I find that annoying. Which is why Neil has a sleep tape that goes, man, what the hell's your problem? <laughs> Did you see me crossing the street? I'm walking over here. I'm over here. Right. That's my sleep tape. That's, That's my, his sleep tape. It lulls me to sleep. Oh, All right. That's right so here, we go. here we go. We've got time for a here few we more. Go. Let's keep mm -hmm. going. Let's keep going. Here we go. Um, oh, my goodness. Where is this great question? Where are you? Beth Tomlinson says this from Facebook. Do marine mammals have different ways of communicating depending upon where they are in the world or their geography? For example, a dolphin in the Gulf Coast, uh, will, does it make different sounds than a dolphin in the Pacific? Um, or, or does that differentiate itself across different types of dolphins? So do, do dolphins have a universal language or do they have dialects? That's what uh, that think, really comes down to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's really the simplest way to put that. Yeah, and I, they, we think they have dialects, and even really? so, yeah. So if we have, the, and that's, but we've sort of seen evidence for that for many, many years. Um, they also, so they have. We don't know if there's certain signals that they share as well. So for example, ac that means across groups of dolphins. It's something that a lot of us are looking at. Um, humpback whales, for example, have make these beautiful haunting songs. Many of you may be familiar with that. And God. I saw Star Trek four. Yeah. You know, save the whales. Right? There you go. <laughs> yeah. That's and good, Chuck. Yeah. Chuck, watch out. They'll, they'll jump on land and find you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go to my door. It'll be a hump back there. <laughs> 
<laughs> like you rang. Good. I like that imitation, Chuck. That's beautiful. Um, but they change over seasons with wow. even within a group of whales, but in different parts of the world, the songs are different for the humpbacks. With dolphins, mm. they not only may have different signals within the populations, but the range of the sounds they make, the frequencies are different. We did a study out of my lab several years ago, and we showed that bottlenose dolphins in Bimini use whistles that are extend over a wider frequency range than in other groups. So it may have to do with their environment and what the soundscape, like you were talking about, Neil, is. You know, their 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 uh, the window that they use maybe that is strange. Mm, yeah, mm, mm. That but we're is... in the infancy of those studies still. And really, some of them just have Russian accents and have Spanish <laughs> accents. That's really all it is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to them, that's all it is. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that's that would be amazing. You know, it's just a dolphin, just like, hey man, how you doing? <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> Here we go. Well, that would be the, uh, the Cheech and Chong dolphin. That's yes, a different it, dolphin, it, right, right? Exactly. Okay. That's <laughs> really. That's... Do you know real quick? You know, dolphins can make two sounds at the same time. There's a little piece of information you might not have known. That's pretty cool. Well, yeah. is one? Uh, can they make one out of their blowhole and one out of their throat, or or the throat no, can they do have, two things? The blowhole has two. It's like two two pot two holes where, that make mm -hmm. up the blowhole, and each one there are two sacs in each, so they can click and whistle at the same time. Uh, we showed in our lab too that they can whistle. They could do two whistle and squawk at the same time. It's really cool. Mm. Wow, that's yeah. is that their version of walking and chewing bubble gum <laughs> at the same time? <laughs> no idea. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here okay, we go. Time here for go. like two fast ones, Chuck. Go. All right, here we go. Hello, Dr. Tyson, Dr. Reese. Um, it has been stated that who, who is this? Who said, who said this? Oh, I'm sorry. Their name is this is uh, Don Reem from Facebook. Don Reem. Yes, and Don says this. It is said that math is the universal language, which is. Um, the basis of which the numerals zero through nine. The origins of that number system has to do with the digits that we carry on our hands. Would an intelligent species share our same mathematics even if they had a different amount of digits or no digits at all? Hmm. I can hmm. comment on that. I don't know. It, it, Dan, Dan, it, do, can dolphins count? Uh, yeah, there's been evidence that they can track uh, numbers of items and and they and they can they can uh, discern quantity differences. Several and, and that's really all that counts. That's really all that counts. Yeah, Correct. Where store the counts. food? The base system that you use actually doesn't matter if you it can doesn't. keep track of, of a number. Right. And yes. and what we presume in my field is, since any other number base system would be arbitrary based on right. you have 12 fingers, 10 fingers, six fingers. If you were going to communicate, you would de-arbitrize it and just use base two, which is the smallest base you can use where you can meaningfully count. And so, so base two, that's why all computing is base two, is one reason for that, zeros and ones. So you'd say, no matter how many fingers you had, let's use base two. And that would be the fallback for what this would be. Yeah. So Chuck, wow. we have time for one more, just last one. All right, this is Varsha Chakhadi, I think, from Facebook. Hi, Dr. Tyson, Dr. Reese, greetings from India. Nice. Have we really been able to comprehend fully the ways animals communicate one among one another, truly owing centuries of evolution and sustaining very many calamities under the water? Their communication would have been more complex for even the human brain to understand. So, uh, you know, is it the fact that they've been here a lot longer than we have? Could that mean that they're speaking in a language that uh, that we're incapable of comprehending? We're just too stupid to figure it out. Right. We we are not very far ahead with that, I have to say. So, I tend to agree. I think we don't know how complex it is. Is the best way I can say it. It may be quite complex. It's a challenge for us to decode. It has, people have tried for a long time. We're still trying, but I think uh, we still have a long way to go. They're clearly Diane, as communicating. Carl, as Carl Sagan famously said, uh, we judge animals by how well they can communicate with us, how a dolphin could, but we never judge ourselves for how well we can speak dolphin. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually think dolphins, Neil, I have to say, I think dolphins have come a bit further than we have in terms of figuring it out excellent excellent and just just to take us out um i think the 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 whale has the the biggest mammal brain the elephant brain is pretty big as well where's the elephant on the encephalon
encephalization quotient. quotient. Yeah. The, the encephalitis Elephant. quotient. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds bad when you say it that way. I know. Um, Anything with an itis is bad, but go yeah, on. Yeah, right. So the elephant brain is about similar uh, in relative size to its body as the a great ape brain. Great ape brain. So okay. great apes, great apes are brains relative to the the size of the body are um, are about two point two point three. Remember, dolphins are about four point two. Humans are seven. Elephants are about two point three. And Diane, it does sound like you guys invented this EQ to give more credit to these other mammals because for the longest while while we all grew up it was humans have the largest brain relative to our body weight to any animal mm -hmm. even even dolphins right so any other animal would look at humans as having these stupidly large heads right compared right. to our bodies so then you come up with this other measure which is what is the minimum brain to run the body anything in excess of that that's really your intelligence exactly well it, it at least gives us an idea of a, it gives us a comparison okay it doesn't mean it equates with intelligence is there any animal whose brain is not big enough to control its own body i don't know of that i don't okay. I, I have okay. no idea i think most animals are controlling their body in some way okay. really i you got okay. me there neil okay <laughs> so the so the ratio can know, never go yeah, I'm sorry. I know some so, people who I don't think are controlling their own bodies, <laughs> but I, not directly related to brain size. So the ratio can never get less than one on that well, scale. Well, that, yeah, I, one, it would be the lowest. Yeah. Right, right. Okay, just checking that. Diana, it's been great to have you here on a topic that we've all thought about, but never had an expert to, to anchor us. And so, Chuck, we, as you said earlier, we got to do this again. We got to. Yeah. I bet, I bet we have many, many more questions we didn't even get to. Tons. Yeah, they were great questions. Thanks so much for having me, and thanks everybody out there. Excellent, excellent. So, uh, Dan Reese, and again, your book, uh, give us the title of that again. It's called The Dolphin in the Mirror. The Dolphin in the Mirror. Let's look for that. And Chuck, always good to have you. Always good to be here. All right, this has been Star Talk Cosmic Queries, the uh, Interspecies Communication Edition. <laughs> I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist, bidding you to keep looking up. <laughs> <laughs>